Thank you, Prof, for the nice presentation and the nice reminder uh, that we need uh, every now and then uh, and for the small tips regarding the prophylactic use of beta blockers very operatively uh, and the relation with anemia. Uh, we come to the last session in this uh, afternoon uh, before our debate uh, uh, with the simulator. Um, our next uh, presentation will move to a new group of patients, the pregnant uh, patients with preeclampsia. The topic will be uh, about uh, perioperative cardiovascular implication of uh, preeclampsia. Uh, our uh, uh, Dr. Nuala Locus, uh, uh, hello, uh, she's a postgraduate anesthetic training at the Imperial School of Anesthesia in London. Uh, she is honorary secretary of the Obstetric Anesthesia Association and chair of the educational subcommittee. She serves on editorial board and international journal of, anesthe uh, of obstetric anesthesia. Uh, welcome, Dr. Nuala. Thank you very much, and thank you once again to the um, organizers. It's fantastic to be here. So I'm going to run through some of the cardiovascular and clinical implications of managing a, a pregnant patient who develops preeclampsia. So my learning objectives are I'm going to describe a little bit of the epidemiology and pathophysiology of preeclampsia, and I'm going to present some practical solutions to manage these women if you come across them in your practice. So what do we mean by preeclampsia? I think sometimes people talk about preeclampsia when they actually mean other hypertensive disorders of, pre of pregnancy. But really, it's a spectrum of disease, and we're only uh, now, in, in the last few years, really able to elucidate the various clinical features that go with um, preeclampsia and to try and define them a bit more. So when we talk about preeclampsia, we sometimes do mean preeclampsia, but even within preeclampsia, there are different varieties. But we can also talk, um, there's gestational hypertension, those women that develop high blood pressure, but without the other clinical manifestations of preeclampsia. And lastly, you can have preeclampsia, which is superimposed on or chronic hypertension that was there prior to pregnancy. Now, as I said, preeclampsia represents a spectrum of disorder, um, probably at the one end, preeclampsia, um, but in its severe form, it can progress to eclampsia. HELP syndrome is now rec recognized to be another variant on the spectrum of this disease. And, and lastly, there's an increasing recognition that cardiomyopathy associated with pregnancy also reflects another end of the spectrum. Now, what is the definition of preeclampsia? Well, preeclampsia is defined as new onset hypertension in pregnancy, and it's the new onset that's very critical. And I, I would urge you all, if, you, if your midwife, if your obstetrician says to you, this lady's got high blood pressure, before you say she's got preeclampsia, look at what her booking blood pressure was, because it's new onset hypertension. Um, proteinuria is, is frequently present, not always, but frequently present. Um, and the, a spot protein creatinine ratio is the favored way to diagnose protein in the U, uh, proteinuria in the UK today. Um, sometimes you have evidence of biochemical or hematological abnormalities. And sometimes you can have su symptoms that are suggestive of end organ disease. And in particular, of great concern is fetal growth restriction. We know that uh, preeclampsia is responsible for a huge amount of iatrogenic uh, prematurity. And the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have added on this final point, with or without severe features, to recognize that there is a variation in the clinical features that you will see um, when you look after these women. So the pathophysiology relates to ab abnormal development of spiral arteries um, within the placental uterine bo uh, border. Instead of a nice um, low, low resistance circulation, the spiral arteries are ectactic and present a very high resistance pulsatile blood flow. This leads to uh, chronic ischemia um, of the placenta, which in turn releases um, factors which we know are toxic, oxidative metabolites, um, infl infl inflammatory mediators, which go on to cause the end organ disease that we see in our patients. Um, I think I'll whiz through that. Endothelial dysfunction is a very significant feature of uh, preeclampsia. And of course, one of the organs that has the most sensitive endothelium is of course the kidney. And um, that's why we, the kidneys is one of the first organs to present uh, in a woman who has severe preeclampsia kidney dysfunction. Now, 
we commonly say that the treatment for preeclampsia is to deliver the baby, as if once the baby is delivered, it all gets better. And usually, clinically, the, the woman is well within a few days after delivery. But this is a, a very interesting study looking at endothelial function. And what they found was that endothelial function could be impaired for up to three months after delivery of the baby. So despite our common belief, um, incorrect perception. Preeclampsia does not just go away, and I'll refer back to this point a bit later on. Now, I mentioned that um, there's an, an increasing recognition that um, preeclampsia represents a whole series of diseases that we haven't yet got to grips with. But I think there is a fairly clear, clear recognition now that there are two forms of preeclampsia. Whether or not they're the same disease, and we're mislabeling at the moment, we still don't know, but there are two forms of what we currently call preeclampsia. There's early onset preeclampsia, which is, occurs much less frequently, and it's the most serious type of preeclampsia. Um, you have very early onset sympathetic dominance in the cardiovascular system and elevated circulating markers of endothelial dysfunction. In contrast, late onset preeclampsia, which arrives really just when a woman is reaching term, is much, is much more common, about 80% of cases. And it's often superimposed upon existing maternal conditions associated with endothelial dysfunction. So, for example, diabetes or pre-existing hypertension. Now, the effects of preeclampsia on the heart. If you put if this into a PubMed search, or if you're doing any work on this yourself, um, you will find a whole spectrum of results. The advent of echocardio echocardiography, transthoracic echo, um, has, has really given us a window into what's going on. But in any 10 patients with preeclampsia, you will find a, a whole variation in the types of cardiovascular dysfunction that can appear. But I think generally these are features that most people believe are common to the condition that you will see in the majority of cases. Diastolic dysfunction, reduced left atrial fractional area change and increased isovolumetric relaxation time, reduced stroke volume and cardiac output and increased total vascular resistance. Now, we know that preeclampsia is associated with very significant morbidity. Um, stroke, severe hypertension, eclampsia, pulmonary edema, end organ failure, with the kidneys and the liver, and I've already mentioned iatrogenic maturity. But I want to say a little bit more about cerebrovascular disease. Now, although it's an extremely rare complication, fewer than 1% of all women with preeclampsia de develop a stroke, in women of childbearing age who suffer a stroke, preeclampsia is the single biggest risk factor for stroke. In women with preeclampsia, they, they generally suffer hemorrhagic stroke, and most tend to occur postpartum. This is um, a case series of patients from the US analyzing the National Inpatient Hospital database, um, looking at women who suffered intracerebral hemorrhage in pregnancy. And they found that preeclampsia, the pre presence of preeclampsia, increased the risk up of 10 times. Now, I just want to mention briefly PRES, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Now, I have to say that um, up until about a year ago, I, um, it, I thought, well, this is an extremely rare variant and I'm extremely unlikely to have to see it. Until I anesthet, uh, well, I, I didn't anesthetize. One of my colleagues anesthetized a patient with preeclampsia who um, woke up from their anesthetic and was blind, which is a very alarming thing to happen after anesthesia. This um, differs pathophysiologically from ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke because it is associated with reversible vasogenic edema seen on the CT or MRI. It usually affects the occipital or parietal lobes, um, and it is thought to be sensitive to hypertensive encephalopathy. Now, it's thought to be related to not absolute blood pressures, but rapid changes in blood pressure. So when we looked back at the anesthetic chart of this woman, she had a, a much more labile perioperative course than one ideally would have hoped for. And um, we believe that this is what caused her prayers. Thankfully, she did recover, and her sight returned completely. Now, the management of preeclampsia, um, there are a huge number of international protocols available, whether you look at the UK website, the American website, the Canadian website, they all offer some excellent protocol-based guidelines for the management of preeclampsia, and I'd urge you to take a look at them. There, there's much good information there. These patients should be managed on the delivery suite, um, and emergency blood pressure control is absolutely key, and I'll say a little bit more about that. I'm also going to mention fluid balance and magnesium therapy.
Now, blood pressure control, what are we going to do control to control blood pressure? Well, I think first and foremost, as anaesthetists, we have the ability to provide fantastic analgesia in the form of an epidural. And there's no doubt that if you have a, a woman who's in labour with preeclampsia, uh, the, an epidural, good epidural analgesia can help to, main to keep her blood pressure within acceptable limits. But the questions I want to look at a little bit more closely are what agent should we be using to treat preeclampsia, and, um, what route should we be giving it, and what blood pressure should we be aiming for? Well, first of all, if we look at what agent we, we should be using, what are, the, what are commonly used agents in Q8? Uh, uh, Nifedipine, libetalol, are those the sort of drugs? Okay. So this is um, a, a nice review, systematic review looking at 15 RCTs, more than 900 women, and they looked at oral and sublingual nifedipine versus intravenous libetalol and hydralazine. Um, and I think sometimes there's a perception that an oral drug isn't going to be as effective as an intravenous drug. Certainly as an anaesthetist, it, it doesn't feel, it feels much more comfortable for us to give an intravenous drug. But actually, in this um, review, they found that oral nifedipine was as, as effective as labetalol or intravenous hydralazine. And there was no difference in maternal or fetal outcome with any particular agent used. So this review didn't say that you had to come down on one side or the other. Both agents, nifedipine, or labetalol, or hydralazine, were all equally effective. This is a, a very nice, um, I think it's, it's it, with the constraints of research, I think it is increasingly hard to do randomized controlled trials, but this is a very elegant randomized controlled trial published about uh, three years ago now. And what this group looked at, it's a small study, 60 patients, and um, we, one group was randomized to receive oral nifedipine with um, an intravenous placebo, and the other group was randomized to receive um, intravenous uh, libetalol and an oral placebo. And again, what they found was that um, oral nifedipine was as effective and in fact m more rapidly treated blood pressure in our hypertensive emergency and preeclampsia. So although it may not feel natural for us to give an oral drug, I think you should feel very comfortable and sometimes it's quicker and easier to get an oral drug out of the cupboard than trying to mix up an intravenous solution. One thing I would say to you is that some, not all drugs, are effective for all patients. So whether you choose to use nifedipine or libetalol, if you don't have success within, and there's no guidelines for this, but I would suggest to you two or three doses, you need to switch agents. Now, I want to ask you a question. Which, what do you think is more important in this situation, systolic or diastolic blood pressure? Raise your hand if you think systolic blood pressure is more important. And raise your hand if you think diastolic blood pressure is more important. Okay, well look, I think it's the end of the day and I'm sh everyone's tired, but this is the one point I think I'd like you to take from this talk. Systolic hypertension is the most important factor in when you've got a hypertensive preeclamptic patient that needs treating. It directly correlates with the risk of stroke. And in the UK, successful maternal confidential inquiry reports have, have recommended to treat the systolic blood pressure and bring it down to 150. And we do have good research evidence, although again, it's an, another small study. This is an observational study, 10 years old now, but it's still probably some of the best data that we have, looking at patients who suffered um, stroke and the change in their cardiovascular parameters. And 95% of patients who suffered a stroke had blood pressures greater than 160. And if you look at these diastolic blood pressures, they were they were also high, but not of so much concern. So I think the one point I want you to take from this talk is that to treat blood pressures of greater than 150, because that's what's going to reduce your instance of cerebrovascular complications. Now, I mentioned um, analgesia, epidural analgesia, but sometimes anaesthetists worry about performing epidural analgesia in a preeclamptic patient. We, I've mentioned the endothelial dysfunction. This is associated with platelet activation, and of course we can have thrombocytopenia. So what we're worried about is vertebral can canal hematoma. This is a, a ca obviously a catastrophic complication for a patient, but I think it's equally catastrophic for clinicians these days. We've had something about medico legal today, and I think you know this complication happens. There, it's catastrophic for the patient who who may take legal action. Um, it's rare. Um, the risk factors aren't obstetric patients, elderly patients, patients who are on anticoagulation therapy and I've said that it's catastrophic. The prognosis is poor in vertebral canal hematoma. There is a limited time to treat. So what stops us doing epidural sometimes in preeclampsia is the concern about the platelet count. Now this is 
the, uh, the very old study that um, our recommendations are currently based on with, with regards to platelet levels. They looked at 100 women with severe preeclampsia or chronic hypertension. Um, 26 developed help. Um, platelet, um, no, par no parturient in this study had an elevated PT or APTT. Of the patients who had a platelet count of less than 150, 75% went on to develop a platelet count of less than 100. The recommendations um, from this study was that um, the, a platelet count of above 100 was acceptable to do an epidural, and only if the platelet count was less than 100 should you uh, consider doing other adjuvant coagulation tests such as prothrombotime or APTT. Um, and they also recommended only doing serial platelet counts if the platelet count goes below 100. But is that what we all do in our day-to-day -day practice? Certainly I think that's a very conservative uh, uh, number and I would consider doing an epidural at quite a significant uh, lower level than that. These are UK recommendations. Um, this is the risk stratification they use. They suggest that with platelets of greater than 100, it's normal risk, so no risk, I would interpret that. There's an increased risk with a platelet count of 75 to 100, and high risk at 75 or less. But before I say, tell you what platelet count I think you should be using, which actually I'm not going to, I'll tell you what I do. I don't know if it's the right thing. I do want to wait, make one other point. There's a big difference between an epidural and a spinal. Um, we know that our epidural needles are much bigger. And so I would urge you, if, if, you're, if you really feel unable to do uh, an epidural because you're concerned about the platelet count, a spinal does have much less associated risks because it's a much smaller needle. There's much a smaller risk of vascular damage. Now, in terms of what platelet count you should be using, well, well my personal cutoff is 70. Um, although I would do additional plate, uh, assessments of PT and NAPTT, and if this was normal, I would do it. So my cutoff is 70. The other point I want to make is it's not the absolute platelet count, it's the rate of change. So a w if a woman has had platelet count of 90, 80, 70 over a few, well, you probably wouldn't, be, but to say a platelet count of 90 for the last two weeks, I'd be very happy with that and I wouldn't worry. But if a woman came into hospital and had a platelet count of 120 yesterday, and this morning it's, it was 90, and it's now five o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be much more concerned about that lady because the rate of change of her platelets is much more concerning. So it's not just absolute numbers, it's the rate of change. Now, another reason that platelet counts, are, um, epidurals are sometimes, uh, we worry about them is, um, the risk of cardiovascular compromise, and I'm particularly talking about spinal anesthesia as opposed to epidural anesthesia. So our primary anesthetic goal in a severely preeclamptic parturient is to optimize blood pressure, obviously, um, optimize utero-placental perfusion, and to prevent um, seizures and stroke. Now, historically, we've been concerned about doing spinals in patients with preeclampsia because we've believed that they, it may precipitate severe hypotension, leading to critically compromised utero-placental perfusion. So is this borne out by the evidence? Well, this is quite a nice but small review published um, just last year. First of all, comparing spinal anesthesia um, in severely preeclamptic with normotensive patients. And what these studies found was that there was a lower incidence of hypotension with the, in the preeclamptic patients compared to the um, normotensive patients. So the preeclamptic patients actually got less hypotension than the patients who didn't have preeclampsia. And certainly there was no difference in maternal or fetal outcomes. What about when you compare spinal anesthesia to epidural anesthesia? Well, it doesn't perform quite so well. There was a higher incidence of hypotension when spinal anesthesia was performed for cesarean section as opposed to epidural anesthesia. But again, there was no difference in maternal or fetal outcomes. So the, the author's conclusion was that it's very reasonable to perform spinal anesthesia. And I think that um, that would certainly be my belief. If I'm really concerned, I may consider doing a, a combined spinal epidural, an, a, a, an epidural anesthetic with a, a lower spinal dose initially and then topping up with an epidural. But for the most part, I, I would do a spinal anesthetic. Now, fluid balance and oliguria. What I want to um, really emphasize, I think if I'm allowed to emphasize one more point today apart from the blood pressure, 
post-delivery oliguria in these patients is inevitable. If, you see, if your patient is not passing half a mil per kilo per hour of urine, do not worry. It is almost inevitable in these patients. And continued fluid restriction is appropriate. Remember, they have a very leaky endothelium. If you pour fluids in, <clears throat> you risk causing pulmonary edema. If you're really concerned, and I would urge you to do this anyway, you must always check for the presence of hemorrhage or sepsis as a cause of hypovolemia. But when giving fluids, you have to balance the risks of kidney injury versus pulmonary edema. Now, my personal view, and I think the evidence um, supports this, is that kidney injury is easier to treat than pulmonary edema. Kidney injury doesn't kill, pulmonary edema does. So I would suggest to you to use clinical judgment, caution, and frequent re-evaluation. And of course, I'd urge you to avoid non-steroidals. Now, just to wind my talk up, um, how to manage an eclamptic fit and how to manage a recurrent eclamptic fit. Um, and this is a very easy question to answer. Magnesium sulfate is the therapy of choice to control seizures. A loading dose of 4 grams should be given by infusion pump over 5 to 10 minutes, followed by a further infusion of 1 gram an hour for 24 hours. And importantly, uh, anticonvulsants, diazepam and phenytone should no longer be used as first-line drugs. Um, eclamptic seizures are almost always self-terminating. Um, the reason you're giving magnesium in that situation is to try and prevent further seizures and to halt the onset of the preeclamptic pre process. You're not giving it to terminate the seizure. It will almost always self-terminate. If you do have a recurrent seizure, what should you do? Well, you should give further magnesium, a further bolus of two grams. Now, I just want to tell you about something that didn't happen in my hospital, a uh, hospital down the road. It was a normal day on the labor ward and Mrs. A was being induced at term for moderate preeclampsia. She started to fit, and the whole multidisciplinary team arrived and gave her some IV magnesium. But five minutes later, she had a respiratory arrest. Any idea what's gone on there? Any clues? Okay, so what happened there? Mrs. A was a petite lady, and instead of giving the magnesium as a slowish bolus over five to 10 minutes, the overenthusiastic obstetric registrar had given it as a rapid bolus over 10 seconds. Because of her relative diminutive body mass index and the, and the five grams of magnesium, she suffered magnes acute magnesium toxicity leading to respiratory arrest. She was treated promptly with calcium and she did fine. But as I, just to reiterate, you're not, the urge when you've got a fitting patient is to inject that drug as quickly as possible, but you must give your magnesium slowly over at least five minutes. Um, so I mentioned the confidential inquiry report this morning. Um, a woman in her late 30s woke her husband overnight, calling out in her sleep, followed by a seizure. She was unable to move her left arm. She was admitted, but despite appropriate care, continued to have seizures. Over the next day in the intensive care unit, she managed, she continued to have a left-sided hemiparesis. CT scan performed 36 hours after she presented revealed a right intracranial hemorrhage and she died, unfortunately. <coughs> neuroimaging should be performed urgently in any woman with hypertension or preeclampsia who has focal neurology and who, which does not resolve. Um, We've heard a lot today about risks and continued risks, and I said at the start of my talk that we talk about the treatment for preeclampsia being delivery, and that does treat the acute problem, but unfortunately for that woman, the risks do not go away. And we have excellent evidence now that preeclampsia and pre-pregnancy does predispose you to much greater risks of cardiovascular disease later on in life. So just to summarize, um, our understanding of preeclampsia continues to evolve, and I'm not sure that we will be calling everything we currently call preeclampsia um, the same in five to 10 years' time. Treatment must prioritize BP control. Systolic BP of less than 150 is what you should be aiming for. Watch fluid balance carefully. Thank you very much again for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Lucas, for the detailed presentation of a subject that usually we forget, especially if we are not obstetric anesthetists. Uh, uh, we are open for discussion, please. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, Salim Jadi, anesthetist in uh, Razi Orthopedic Hospital.
I'm just going to ask the prof here on, on the, the right-hand side. I'm just wondering, uh, a few days ago we had a case of a patient arrested on table in theater, a uh, young uh, trauma case. Uh, fortunately for the patient, I was not involved in the resuscitation, but the resuscitation went on for 45 minutes and the patient recovered completely after 45 minutes with no rusk. I'm just wondering, do you have a time limit of, of actually continuing resuscitation? I, I'm saying fortunately because I'm kind of 30 minutes used to be the cutoff line for me. I'm just wondering for how long should we continue resuscitating a patient? Yes, I, I think that's a Im very important question. F now, from, we, from your description, that was a witness arrest because it occurred in the OR. So you have a big advantage that you initiate uh, uh, CPR without a no-flow state. I think the duration will depend on a couple of things. One is evidence that there is organ viability. For example, in other settings, I will continue to do um, effort if the heart is fibrillating. Because a heart that is fibrillating is a heart that, is, that has a chance of recovering cardiac activity. Now, if there is a persistent asystole for more than 20, 30 minutes, and the CPR is ineffective, for example, by documented that your end-tidal CO2 is low, less than 10 millimeters of mercury, and if you have a, uh, ultrasound and the heart is not moving, and you don't have any other options, you don't have ECMO, for example, available, I think at that point it's reasonable to stop the uh, uh, CPR and pronounce the patient. But if you have other capabilities and there's evidence of viability, I don't believe there is time. Let me give you a very brief example. I treated a patient about a year ago, young lady, 17 years old, massive pulmonary embolism, practically in cardiac arrest. I think it was a very severe shock, but she was unresponsive. We couldn't detect the pulse. We had her on a Lucas device for more than an hour. In the meantime, we figure out that that was pulmonary embolism, severe, massive. We give a bolus of a thrombolytic agent, and she recovered fully. Uh, so knowing what is the etiology and having a plan to move forward, I think, enables you to continue attempting resuscitation. This patient for half an hour really, uh, he was assisted for half an hour and there was no uh, circulation and the entire surgery was low and then he started at uh, VFIP and he was shocked a few times and then he recovered after a couple of 15 minutes. So I'm just wondering if, if I was involved after association, as you said, probably after half an hour with low CO2, asystole, probably how I, was have, I would have terminated the resuscitation for this guy. But this guy now is completely recovered. I, I, I don't so have how long was the patient in asystole? Half an hour. Half an hour. I wasn't there. That's okay. the information I got myself. It's, it's, it's bothering me because, as I said, if I was involved in that case, probably half an hour would be the cutoff line for me. Do you know what was the temperature? Because there are mitigating factors. Is there was hypothermia, for example? It was not an active hypothermia. It probably was hypothermic, I would suspect, but I wouldn't, it was, there was no active hypothermic measures for this patient. Uh, she's going to I just want to add something to that. I, I'm not in that situation very uh, frequently, um, but I, I think it's a very difficult decision when you've been resuscitating a patient for a long period of time. Um, you know, there's, regardless of how well you know the patient, there becomes some emotional investment in it, and I think it's difficult to be the person that says, I think we should stop. And certainly in the UK, it's, it's always a team decision. The hardest thing is somebody says somebody has to start that discussion. Do you think we should think about stopping? But it always comes down to being a team decision. And I think increasingly, it, it, when I'm placed in that situation, I try to make sure I've got somebody else of a, a, a similar level of seniority there just to confirm that they agree. Um, but it's always a team decision ultimately. But I agree. I think it's incredibly difficult. Any more questions, please? Can I just add, it depends also on the age of the patient, comorbidities, why this patient like, had a witness arrest? Was it because of massive bleeding? Um, so it is at induction. That was the cause, probably severe hypotension, the drug reactions or something. So we have to think why this patient arrested.
and do as much as possible and maximize the time since he is I, a young patient. I, I, I completely agree. I, I, I think um, we, just because we can doesn't mean we should. And, and sometimes our skills, are, well increasingly our skills are going beyond the, um, our ethical understanding and knowledge. And sometimes we do, our th do things and then it's only afterwards we think and reflect upon it. Um, but I completely agree, it's the, whole, it's the context of the whole situation. I think that being in the hospital and in an environment in which this, the event occurred in relation to a procedure it's totally different from dealing with a patient that suffers sudden cardiac arrest at home. And you might have a hypothesis, why is it that the patient went into cardiac arrest and it was pharmacologically related to severe hypotension, then I think you have something to work with. Perhaps there's a way of reversing the hypotension. I mean, that's not something that happens commonly in the usual setting of a sudden cardiac arrest, that the mechanism is severe hypotension, something usually it's a cardiac event. So in that particular case, I will be encouraged to continue finding ways of providing what is critical, which is adequate myocardial blood flow. Now you have another option, which is to escalate in terms of the technique. If you're in the OR, maybe it's reasonable at some point to open the chest and do something that we forgot, which is open chest direct cardiac compression. Uh, so I will be very creative in that. And I, I, I will echo the idea of when to terminate sometime, you need somebody else. Or ask the question. We have just instituted something, we call it the time out in ICU. Sometimes we are so focused on one aspect that we might ignore something very important and somebody else who is next door can say, wait a minute, do you notice that you don't have the EKG connected in, it's not a system, whatever. So it's good sometimes to bring other people to the scene in those situations in which you have somebody who was alive the moment in which you start the procedure and, and brainstorm, not just the H and T's, but beyond that. I just, I just want to make one comment. If you want to read a really fantastic story about resuscitation, you may know it. It's the story, um, if you put into Google, Swedish doctor, lake, resuscitation, for several, something like that. It's the story of a Swedish orthopedic surgeon, a female orthopedic surgeon. She was skiing. She fell into uh, a lake. She was hypothermic. She suffered a cardiac arrest. And she had um, a several hours downtime. Um, but she was freezing cold. They got her, they worked so hard because it was one of their colleagues. They got her back and initially she had no motor function at all and she said, I wish you'd let me die. I don't want to live like this. But she got um, all of everything recovered apart from her fine motor function. So she did have to switch careers to be a radiologist, but I don't think that's so bad. <laughs> anyway, it's a fantastic story to read if you could put it into Google. I think we just raised a very nice subject and Prof would like to comment. Um, I, I think I'm not really adding anything except to put it in the sense that when we are managing these cases, uh, sometimes we get into the, in, in, into the uh, heat of the moment and we forget, uh, as, as the lady quite nicely said, you know, what about the history? What about everything else? Have we figured out everything else? I presented a case in the intraoperative monitoring yesterday where uh, at induction, the, uh, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, um, the, the patient had uh, hokum, and the, the anesthesiologist uh, chose to give ephedrine. And with the hypotension and the ephedrine, the, the, the uh, blood pressure actually got worse. And then the anesthesiologist uh, started giving epinephrine. Well, the wheels really started to come off. And at that point, an echo was inserted, and it was a very clear, great big lump. I showed you the echo uh, two days ago. A great big lump of a, of a hokum, and with a systolic anterior motion, uh, 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 SAM. So sometimes we can figure out, sometimes not. But it go, when, when this is almost like the oral exam. When you're faced with a really complex situation, go back to the basics. What is the history? What are the physical findings? Is there something else I can figure out? The echo really helps if it is in, uh, in, in experienced hands. I, I don't believe in you know, somebody taking a weekend course coming in and say, oh yeah, I know what's going on with the echo. Uh, and then if after all of that, nothing, uh, nothing helps, uh, 
uh, there's no, t no hypothermia, nothing else, um, then we are not God. And th that's where the team decision comes in. So it really is a context of a sequence of steps. It's not just after half an hour do I just stop. Real Before you stop, have we done all the right steps? Thank you everybody for the nice uh, attendance of this evening and thank you to all our uh, speakers. Uh, I think Dr. Ali is leaving us, uh, so... Uh, actually, uh, to the issue of, uh, of shocking uh, rhythm, shockable rhythm, uh, Professor Gazmuri nicely illustrated in one slide and also we we learn a lot from our uh, device patient when they go to VF and then they get detected by the device and they get shocked you see that the most successful uh, shock is when administered very early and a lot of time the patient may be going to VF